Well, hello and welcome to the Dr. Tech Show. It's uh, 12 o'clock and it's Monday, so you know now that we'll be here. Come rain or come shine, whatever we can do. Um, we will be here every Monday, Dr. Tech Show, helping you with your tech problems and particularly your tech issues, trying to communicate uh, when you can't see people face to face. Um, and we do have a special guest today, more of that later. Uh, but I am here in my Huddersfield on quite as warm as it has been some of the days, but it certainly is pretty warm um, up here in the in the attic. I've got the window wide open and uh, some uh, much needed breeze uh, coming through. So, Pauline, how is it for you in Birmingham? It's another glorious day in Birmingham, John and Swain. It's uh, yeah, I don't know what degrees it is, but it's been very very warm. We've got a fan on here in the office, so. Uh, hopefully that's not noisy, but um, yeah, lo another lovely day and more expected, I think, this week for Birmingham. Excellent. And Swain, um, how is it? How is it? We had our we had our one day heat wave yesterday. It got to about eighteen or nineteen in Orkney. Um, <laughs> today it's dull, overcast, thunderstorms forecast. So we'll just wait for that excitement. All right. Okay. So you're getting those first, are you? Because we. Um, sorry, I've just been distracted because the cat's just trying to get on my lap. Um, <laughs> So I didn't have enough to contact. Um, yeah, I think we, we're forecast with us tomorrow evening, I think it is. Mm. Uh, they're coming our way. But, uh, um, and of course, you know, if you wonder what the weather's like, there's plenty of weather apps out there and weather websites. You, you can look at weather radar and all those kind of things. And you can see how you can see where the weather's coming from and how long the storms are likely to last and all these kind of things. And you can um, ask, ask, ask Alexa. I often ask Alexa. I stand at my uh, Alexa downstairs and I say, okay, what's the weather like in Birmingham as if I couldn't look out the window? What's the weather like then in other places where my family lives? So it's good to know that when I do ring them, I can talk to them knowledgeably about their local <laughs> weather. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I, I would sometimes wonder if you ask Alexa what the weather is, why, do, why doesn't it just reply, look out the window? Oh, that would mean it knew it, it knows where you are, John. It's not meant to know that, is it? Unless you <laughs> enable those settings. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, welcome everybody, and uh, welcome you. Don't forget, if you want to join in the show, you can email drtechshow at gmail dot com, um, and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear from your experiences about uh, getting online for the first time during lockdown. Uh, we'd love to hear from you about if you've been helping your family members. We'd love to hear if you need any advice on uh, getting an online at these kind of times. I should just explain I'm using a different camera to what I use normally and it, it seems to be scrolling through some effects that I hadn't enough time to change before we started. So like now, if it goes a bit strange, then uh, you'll know that I'm scrolling through the effects and it does make me disappear from time to time. Oh, it's like that. That was hilarious. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like that magic trick. Um, who was it? There was a magic trick where a man made an elephant disappear on stage. Did you know about that one? And he did it through using mirrors. So the elephant was still there, um, but uh, because the mirrors were there, you could just see the whole of the stage without the elephant on it. Um, I think this was sometime in the 19th century. Um, but uh, I hope I haven't spoiled that for anybody. <laughs> if anybody thinks uh, it is possible to make an elephant disappear on stage. But anyway, um, okay, so we'll kick off this week's show with um, some work you've been doing, as usual, Pauline, on investigating the kind of things we can be celebrating digitally this week. So what have you found for us this week? Well, this was one that Swain found. Um, so take a bow, Swain, for oh. your, um, your, your research and online purposes. Um, so apparently it's National Allotments Week, which starts today and runs until the 16th of August. And it started in uh, 2002. Um, and the theme for 2020 is growing food for health and well-being, which is, I'm sure we can all get behind. And um, so this year, every week has been National Allotments Week. Uh, according to the National Allotment Society, with more people than ever realising growing your own food is a great way of getting healthy, getting some outdoor exercise in the fresh air and acquiring new skills. And plot holders, as, as I know from my own uh, plot holder friends, have also benefited from the contact with nature and the easy camaraderie on allotment sites, helping to retain their mental health and stay positive during these, these worrying times. So the uh, National Allotment Week, uh, had a, there was a competition and they have a YouTube channel so people can have a look there and see what the, um, what the winners, and maybe runners and riders uh, have entered. And they also uh, would like to see more entries. So they're asking for people to email 
entries about their allotments to diane at nsalg.org.uk and also gardeners world tv program um, apparently would also be interested in receiving videos from plot holders and there's a link on the youtube uh, link which john will put after the uh, program to how to send videos in and apparently there's also a government um, initiative swain do you want to do you want to refer to that or shall i go on you just carry on Pauline. that's okay. fine so anyone I mean, who the, knows me knows how unlikely it is I am to know anything about allotments. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the government obviously wants to uh, hear about what uh, uh, people have on their allotments and that they want to see them, uh, how much they're valued by the local community. So again, we put a link in after the show um, about assets of community value and how, and how to protect them. So people, if they have allotments, can, uh, can write in about it. And John, you've got some allotment sto related stories, I think, about allotments and tech. Um, well, it, it, part of that about the allotments and tech is going back to the story I think we've already told on the show about the that I had under development uh, Olympics where we were trying to uh, uh, trying to get funding for a project where we would get people who were uh, en had entries in local produce shows to in, to uh, enter their um, their products online to an online competition. Uh, this video thing's getting distracting, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still here. Um, the um, entered into an online competition, uh, which we didn't get funding for. But uh, it seems to me the time has come for that kind of thing now. Mm. Um, of course, the other thing about allotments is that uh, we could have had a famous allotment holding prime minister in Jeremy Corbyn, but it was not meant to be. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, not men, not commenting politically on that one. But uh, you know, I'm sure if he had become prime minister, he would have encouraged us all to have allotments. And certainly, you know, there is a big movement going now, not just on allotments, but people, people um, online, um, well, using using the internet to spread the word about things like guerrilla gardening and that kind of thing, planting vegetables in roadside verges, and, and these kind of things. Um, and I think certainly, you know, increasingly in the future, I think uh, we will need to be more self-sufficient with food. So uh, all that kind of thing's got to be a good thing. Well, I've certainly benefited from my friends who have allotments. Um, shout out to Grace, who has supplied me with uh, loads, loads of different great leafy green vegetables last year. And this year, she gifted me with uh, dwarf kale, uh, some kind of cauliflower, which I don't, don't think has worked yet. Uh, oh, sorry, hasn't, hasn't uh, sprouted yet. And some tomato plants. So thanks, Grace, and uh, good allotmenting. Okay. Well, I so you don't have any allotment stories then, Swain. You're, um... Oh, I do, but they're not for telling here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, uh, from long ago. I'm, lo I'm losing the battle, by the way, with... Uh, this is Smudge, Hi, by Smudge. the way. Smudge oh, is Smudge. a relatively elderly, grumpy, cantankerous cat. If he decides he wants to be somewhere, then he has to be there. Um, you know, and he will fight and fight and fight. Uh, and I've just moved him, so he will be back again in a minute, I think, desperately trying to get on the seat that I'm on. Because I, I had to remove him from this seat to sit down to do this programme. So, and he's basically, basically decided that this is his territory now. And, and he's also, well, he also likes to sit on the keyboard, so I'm having to move the keyboard. So we're discovering during lockdown that cats really do rule the world. The Egyptians yeah. are right, and we should adore them. <laughs> yeah. He's now... He's now staring at the keyboard, which I'm having to remove from him. But anyway, um, I'll try to ignore that, that distraction and introduce our special guest for today. So uh, we have a special guest, uh, and I'd like to welcome Paul Clayton. So hello, Paul. Hello. Uh, really good to have you on, on board. Paul is somebody I've known for quite some time. We've certainly bumped into each other at quite a few events in the past. Um, and Paul is a man after my own heart who works in a lot of different communities, working on digital inclusion issues. And um, uh, and I thought he would be a really good person to have on uh, and talk through the kind of things he does and the strategies he deploys and that kind of thing. So, Paul, do you want to start just by telling us how you got into the field of digital inclusion? Um, yeah, I was a um, I came to London in '97, working for an internet provider, and I started out in sales, moved into tech support, and it was uh, a regular uh, series of uh, hell really, 12 hours of hell for each day, each session worked. And uh, I realized there was a lot of la a lot of people that just didn't know what on earth was going on. And when I left that job, I decided I'd like to be a, a, a 
a bit more involved in that side of things. Uh, took a teacher training course and just went on from there. Um, started working for Lewisham College and Southwark College, uh, helping young people. And I was asked to uh, get involved with a, um, an introduction to computing for people with disabilities, which just lit me up. Um, I'd been doing work with visually impaired people occasionally anyway, and as, a, as something on the side, and uh, I found it tremendously inspiring. Um, one of my uh, learners was a Nigerian shot putter. She was a gold medalist, and she was really quite something as well. So I've had um, what's really quite nice from that starting point. I've still got one person I still meet from that group. Um, and I've, I've moved on to do, working with charities that um, help people at home. I've done a, a number of years working for a UK online project uh, for Greenwich Borough. So now I'm working in Greenwich Borough again, but with a community centre. So there's the present. Okay. All right. Well, well thank you for that. And, uh, you yeah, know, I think, I think like us, you found... Uh, um, the, the whole digital inclusion field is is a bit of a minefield in many respects. Um, uh, it's for me, uh, it's been a little bit uh, hampered, I think, by funding sources which have uh, attempted just to try to put large numbers of people through programmes which don't necessarily benefit them in the long term. Um, and that, uh, from my point of view, and I think from yours and from lots of other people's point of view, we need to we need to learn from the worlds of community development and adult learning and those kind of things about how you make things interesting, educational, entertaining, and stay with them for the long term. Uh, I think you're sort of coming from a similar kind of viewpoint to that, Paul. Absolutely. I've um, I've I've uh, witnessed a lot of projects where just computers were given to people with a, a level of support that was never really adequate. Um, and uh, well, recently in uh, Lewisham, where I live, um, there were some iPads being given out by the library and access to the library services was fantastic. Uh, peer walls for newspapers were just around, you know, circumnavigated, all sorts of things. And yet there was no real sense of... Um, ownership. Uh, these were iPads in a very poor borough. Um, and, I'm, and I've seen a lot of this, a lot of the services are, uh, are on offer tend to be for the short term, uh, just to tick some boxes. And people like myself, and you, John, I think, um, would appreciate that the, it's a numbers game. Uh, we have to be seen to be getting people through the door and out again to qualify for any decent funding, um, it, rather than getting people up to a level that they can actually have confidence. I mean, my game generally is what I say to people, I'd, I, I'm here to not, I'm, I, I don't want you to ask me anymore. <laughs> I, want, I want you to be self-sufficient and, and confident and an owner. Yeah. Yeah. Taking ownership, I think is a very, um, very valid point there. You know, it's, uh, there's all these things that we've talked about on this program before is people don't feel it's part of their lives. They put their devices away. They don't charge them. Um, you know, when you ask them where it is, they don't know where it is, all these kind of things. And, uh, those, you know, unless you actually get people to want to love and cherish uh, what mm. these things bring to their lives, I think you know, you're never really going to succeed. What's your, um, when you're advising people on, do you, do you advise people on, on specific devices to, to buy, Paul? And if so, what's, um, your, well, that's what's a, your preference? It, well, that's a very interesting bug because I do say um, to people that we love our friends and family, um, but their technical knowledge and digital cast-offs are very variable. <laughs> so um, the, the, what happens is that I, I do try to make recommendations if someone is consistently struggling um, because it's I've, I've been a salesman but I choose not to be now so what I try to do is make a, just a, a, an honest and sincere recommendation for a different type of thing um, along the lines of well ac access and cognitive ability and the other things but it's really tricksy sometimes. Uh, we have to go for what's in the marketplace because mm -hmm. people can afford that or I can get it secondhand, which has its own issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah, recommendations are tough. Um, I 
do try to I've, I've had people um just recently on this series of zoom sessions i've been hosting have just gone out without any say so to me just bought new devices and it's really odd <laughs> i found it very amusing but really quite warming do you um, find that people are buying like um too high spec um equipment or they'll go for an ipad because they've heard it, the name when they don't know much about the possibilities of android uh that's interesting yeah the um a lot of people tend to get stuff given that's why hence the the saying um because they they don't want to invest in something they don't know about so what happens is it has to move from elsewhere um i think in terms of um technology there are, there's there's a bit of a much of muchness i think it's about the form and and form factor and what it does for people um, there are many people with tablets that shouldn't have them. Uh, I know you've had the conversations about dry fingertips, which I found very rarely spoken about. Not many people talk about this. And also issues about arthritic fingers and styluses or styli, um, all the usual things when really a laptop would be sufficient. Um, saying that, what I do do is um, I ditch windows at every opportunity um, and put Linux Mint and go and, and lots of older ladies. It's really quite ironic. Uh, lots of older ladies, especially who have just done that with their computers are extremely happy, very low maintenance. And yet there's people who have a little bit of knowledge going, Ooh, Linux. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, it's, a, it's interesting. I try to sort of provoke the best possible answer. Um, the work I did with Greenwich was underfunded for years and as such uh, I've got a, an attitude uh, to get a do as much as I can for as little as possible and this was something uh, promoted in a project um, it was called Digital Tuesdays in a library where uh, an amazing lady had pushed Southwark Council or Southwark Library it was Tate Library and uh, she'd pushed the library service to have a screen reader and uh, Webby, which is a text-based browser, uh, to have them in there in that library and to have regular users on a Tuesday turn up, uh, people who were visually impaired. She really tried to just promote what was out there and try and get people using it as much as possible because there was a lack of knowledge you were always going to come up against. So I could keep on talking. No, oh, please, <laughs> please do. It's fascinating. We've had the Linux discussion oh, yes. on here on here um a couple of shows ago i mean i think that was one of swain's swain and john certainly uh wax lyrical about using linux i've never been able to do it. We, we were talking about repurposing uh older devices and and installing linux uh, as an alternative so you're certainly preach, preaching to the choir here it's great it adds a few more years of life to an old device with a newer operating system and all the um all the things that that can bring um, it, it can be really lightweight and very useful. Um, the one thing I am realising, though, uh, within these times uh, is that I've had to do um, pick up my tech support headset again. And with every Zoom session, I've had to do tech support calls to all of the participants. It'd been very much a one to one relationship, talking over the phone, using remote access software, which is ironic because this is also the the way which scammers and uh, unscrupulous uh, opportunists get involved. So yeah. um, it's a trust relationship. And I think that's also very core. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we would say um, that, uh, well, in, in my business anyway, we would say uh, it's about time and trust and then tech. You know, you, you take the time to build a relationship with somebody, you, you, gain, tr you gain their trust, um, and, then, and then you add the tech because you know, they, they are vulnerable because they don't know any better or they, they've been, uh, you know, they've been, they, they want to trust somebody and they have to trust somebody about their tech now. So it's even more vital. Um, and we would certainly uh, subscribe to that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've seen some stats on who older people would ask for advice and guidance and support. And it generally fell to friends and family, which again comes back to my... <laughs> little adage of, of how that could be really variable 
and what happens is um, I've come across uh, people's computers that have been wiped and had a complete new system on and lost all the data off that because some young guy has come in and just done a job and not really known what he was doing. So I think what happens is that it, the, that trust building element is, is, is absolutely crucial and how that's done is really tough, I think. Um, I call it the iceberg of engagement whereby yeah. um, people, you only meet their needs, their, their needs at the time as well. And everything else underneath may, it means that they could just disappear at a moment. You'll never really know. Um, it's also so, if, if there's lots of projects funded for the short for short periods of time that are always changing, it's very, very hard to establish an ongoing relationship with people beyond beyond those things if you are operating within a funded project. It's true. Um, I'm very lucky uh, in as much that the project I'm working with now is that I'm just a strand of it. It's all about social isolation and I'm just one part of it. Um, the lady, the project coordinator runs Nana's groups, get togethers. Uh, I think she had some sports for disabled people as well, choirs, all sorts of things. And I, I can sort of jump in here and there and have done. <laughs> but uh, so I think, yeah, it's, it is it's one of those things that community centers can really do again. Um, but again, but the, the problem with the community, uh, the business model of a community center is that it's a series of rooms for hire mm. and that community services don't necessarily pay the bills and they have to be managed and you have to know how to manage them. So um, it has its own issues in itself. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think the one-to-one -one support, um, having that little bit of real world uh, relationship really helped. And also a wonderful Northern accent. Uh, I'll so. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's part of our toolkit, isn't it? You know, to, it's part of building that trust that, um, you know, we want people to think we're, we're not going to scam them. We, well, we need people to think we're not going to scam them because they will be scammed and they will be scammed by people who sound like us as well. So yeah. um, we need something else. So what's your what's your, your kind of quality, quality mark or your, uh, how do people know that they can trust you, Paul? Wow. What, what, what he has question. an honest face. That's the first thing. <laughs> True. Thank not, you. not good for radio, though, Swain. Um, <laughs> no, but I'm just, I just want to reassure all the uh, hope, yes. hope radio listeners that, that Paul Clayton does yeah. have a very honest yeah. face. I do. I like um, <laughs> that's really good of you. Uh, I, it has been said on many occasions. I do also have a face that I call a, a John Doe face. Um, I seem to have the features of like, a, like a, some sort of identikit guy that someone can trust. I, I, I'm someone's friend, someone's cousin. Uh, yeah, it's very odd. I, I have to. On, I generally just say yes. I'm Paul, the other one, um, <laughs> and uh, I'm the other Paul. Mm. Uh, yeah, so but you've, um, worked, you've worked for some organizations that have a, have credibility in this space, haven't you? Well, that's very much the case. Uh, that tends to build in that level of trust in the first instance. Um, I worked with the Greenwich Online for seven years, and we did a lot of work with a big internet bus traveling around the borough. With a um, that was really interesting, um, but ultimately. It didn't really do much uh, towards the end um, because people had moved on and they didn't. I think what has happened is that everyone's needs has shifted mm. uh, and they, they don't want to just. I remember vividly standing outside one school and we were asking a, 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 a mum if they'd want to, you know, pick up their office skills and such. She went, Nah, do you want to do Photoshop? Mm. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, we're not really like that. Um, I think that having an organization align, having an, an alignment with an organization has really proved valuable. Um, working on my own, I've just ended up being a, a freelancer that goes around and helps people with their computers. And that brings in some income, but it's not really what I'm looking for because it's just alleviating a scratch. And, you know, I say to people, where does it hurt? You know, what is the problem? So I think, yes, um, I've, 
it, it is a level of um, perceived professionalism, having something else to work with. And again, that's difficult as well, because so many organisations don't even know what the whole service would entail or have capacity or capability to understand it, mm. especially when they're quite often as well, community services don't have any understanding. I've actually pitched myself to go to community centres and train people, but this is sadly lacking because uh, again, it, it's about volunteering, it's about how you uh, allocate time, space, and they've got to see the value of it uh, mm. very quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had uh, I've had an experience where somebody was contracting me to do a piece of work around digital support, and I think they learned a lot from the conversation they had with me about setting up, the, you know, how, what it would look like. So, the people who are commissioning and procuring work are also needing to learn what they need to know, you know, um, and so yeah. they're learning. They're learning as we go as well, especially now, um, and 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 that's a bit worrying at times because. They are supporting groups and individuals in the community, and you'd like to think that they have a level of understanding of digital that enables them to procure or commission a good service, and well, that's not always the case. No. I, I, when I first met John many moons ago, I was trying to work more in a care-orientated space, and to one of the things I, I realised very quickly was that management needed to be trained much more so than the care workers. Um, and we, uh, I was looking at that quite seriously. Um, one day centre I worked at, I ended up training the activity coordinator because she was absolutely petrified. She'd been an art teacher and lost everyone's work at one point. Uh, yeah, which traumatised her. Um, so what I did was the, this day centre was very interesting. It was for people on the on, with the onset of dementia, and the iPad, the one iPad they had, was just used on a one-to-one -one basis, and they had a, a, a Nintendo Wii as well, which wasn't really used, and they didn't know how to use it, and they had this big TV, and I think TV is the killer. Um, so out of that, I thought about this idea where there should be more. Um, one to many relationships with the device. Um, the coordinator sort of had nice ideas about uh, ascot days, so she'd get everyone to dress up. And I thought, well, why don't you use some clips from YouTube and you, you can line them up and you can make your own races and then you can guarantee you know who's going to win. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. I think uh, making a smart TV uh, was something I was thinking about with a, with a Raspberry Pi would have made much more sense and more fun for, uh, for a, a bunch of people, right? rather than just sitting watching telly, which I think it just doesn't help anyone. Um, yeah, I can't guarantee that all our uh, watchers or listeners know what a Raspberry Pi is or a smart TV, Paul. So do you oh. want to just explain oh, I, oh, what that would know. mean? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, a Raspberry Pi. Now, this is a... Um, it was done as a nostalgic piece of retro computing, but it's one. it's a computer with one printed circuit board everything's on it so you can plug it into a tv that's what it's designed for like the old days of computing in the 80s and what you'd play games with it you could do computing with it you can do all sorts of things with it and it's been taken up by the the technical community as a lovely little secondary device um smart tvs well they're a bit like having your computer already built into your tv really um, they provide internet access, they provide access to services, all sorts of extra things. It's a bit like teletext on steroids, really. I think that's the best way to describe it. <laughs> Without the anger issues, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> well, I completely agree with you about the interactive TV, Swain. And I, I just chip in as my video is about to go haywire. Um, but um, the, you know, as I've may have said before on the show is that when my late mother was in a care home it used to frustrate me that they they all sat around watching the tv and uh, getting no interaction mm. with it uh, and most of them weren't interested in what was on the tv it was just background noise um and and therefore the fact is but but it is a piece of technology that they understood so adding a bit of interactivity to that i think is not a big leap for a lot of people uh, it might be a surprise at first. Oh, my TV can talk back to me, but 
it, you know, I think it, 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 is a, it is a good way of getting people into that uh, that kind of arena. And you've anticipated. I know from the little bit of a pre-chat that we had, Paul, that you're not interested in cricket, but I'm going to talk about cricket for a little while. Um, well um, done, Ireland, last week, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm actually just about, I'm just starting to write a blog post, which may see the light of day. Um, my health and pain issues uh, allowing at some point this year. Um, but the, the blog post I'm writing is that, um, I, I don't know who, how many people are aware of this, but um, the county cricket season has just started about a week ago uh, in England. Um, it's called the Bob Willis Trophy this year, named after um, ex-England fast bowler and captain who died of prostate cancer recently. Um, but because nobody's allowed in the grounds, every single game in that competition is being live streamed on YouTube. Um, and it's also been live streamed in a multi-camera way. Um, certainly until, uh, and this is a phone call I warned people I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be expecting. So I'll come back to this. Do you want to talk about something else? <laughs> yeah, no problem. Not at all. Paul, have you got any, um, when we had a group uh, of ladies on, uh, was it last week only, uh, from Lancaster, I think they were, uh, they talked about coming online for the first time and they were they were business women who um, had not worked online as a, as a group or as individually, most of them before. They were doing yoga lessons, Pilates, dance, um, writing wills, one of the ladies, one of the women was, so um, a, a variety of things. And they were telling us about how um, when they came online, um, that sometimes things went wrong and uh, how they fixed those things. So um, we're always keen to hear stories of things that didn't go according to plan, Paul, and and how you fix them, if you've got any of those in your repertoire. How we fix them. <laughs> well, um, interestingly, um, I, I, I did a whole Zoom session about problems. I didn't call it troubleshooting. I didn't, um, because and and what happens is there's those technical people because we deal a bit deeper we get more technical issues, um, and sometimes it's just silly stuff. You know, some people I've had one lady phone me up and all she had to do was just restart a computer. You know, it was just sim silly things. Um, I had one lady in one of the Zoom sessions who was whose video was upside down all the way through the meeting. And I've had to try and even control a computer all the time at the time through Zoom to try and work out what on earth was going on. And all the Zooms, all the camera settings were just fine. Everything was just fine. And then when you dig around in the virtual backgrounds, there's a little, there's a little switch in the corner of the video that turns your video 90 degrees and can turn it 180. And I thought, wow, that's just so brilliant. I mean, hey, I've just moved to Australia, everyone. I can imagine that's a real hoot in the business community. I mean, this is where this stuff comes from, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I just can't, you know, I had to really look into it. And one day I stumbled on it. So I think, yeah, technical issues are always, yeah, they're really sticky. They get stickier as well. And I think some things are just, the intermittent problems are the worst ones. Historically, you cannot find a rationale for them because they are hit and miss. So um, when uh, what I do say to people is I start with um, Douglas Adams, really. Uh, I say, don't panic. Don't panic. Um, we can't. Uh, and I, then I do a little bit of emotional intelligence chat and go, your brain gets taken over by your fight or flight. And you can't think anymore. Exactly. All that lovely frontal lobe goodness just disappears. So what you've got to do, and what I have been doing is consistently, I advocate notebooks for people. Use the technology you know already, and then work, and exactly. So what it is, it's, I call it like spreading a cognitive load. I even, I've been working with young people in an employability sense where I just say, write down stuff first before you do it on your machine, because you'll find it easier. And for those who can't type, it's unnecessary because mm -hmm. at least you're just spread, you're two different jobs. You can just copy what you've written down. You don't have to think about it when it's on the screen. So um, 
that's the sort of primary thing is not to panic and to start to make notes about things. So the, the methodology I've been trying to put across to people about creating a journal or a log of good stuff and bad stuff to try and work out what goes on because you might not be able to work it out, but you can give someone an idea as well who might. And yeah. also when you get the right words, it's about the terminology. You get the right words to use. You can then punch them into Google. Punch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I often, I notice that with um, some people uh, working in tech, they, they don't make enough effort to, uh, to bring people along with them on the journey. You know, they, they alienate people by saying, switch to do that or you know do this yoke or whatever and they use a term that just and people, you can see people, people going what, what's that mean whereas i'm used to working with people who make a real effort to explain things i'm, I'm working with my website designer at the minute and uh, a developer and um and he is, is i think he's trying to teach me how to you know work, work, run my own website uh, and the, the back end mm. uh, which is lovely um, and I'm learning far more about coding than I ever probably need to know, although I am applying for a coding boot camp as well. Um, but, you know, th th so there are people like yourself out there who, you know, make the, and it's worth the effort, isn't it? It's worth engaging people in understanding so that they can feel more confident in their, in their digital journey. And, um, and, and, and know, like, that sometimes it's, it's as simple as switching it off and switching it back on again. And, I, you know, I'm still saying that several times oh, yeah. a day to people. I mean, that's my... That's my intro. When I call, when people call me, it's a bit of a joke. Um, <laughs> but you're quite right. I, I, um, I tend to think that what happens is that the um, people can get overwhelmed because what's happened, we have a, a, a mixing up of language. We've got brand names that become adjectives and verbs. And then, we, I mean, when I say web browser, they go, you mean Google? And they go, no, no, it's not. We have to know. I can spend weeks just explaining this and I've, I've had to start making games. I mean, this is something I'm moving towards now. I'm looking at, um, I'm hoping to try and get into a hybrid space where I can bring a real world meeting and a Zoom meeting together. And it's uh, incredibly tough to manage, I think. But one thing I'm really interested in and always have been is the concept of a, of a, a game show format. Um, there was a, a, a PlayStation game with big red buttons. And I know you can actually get apps that go on your device and you've got a big red button. And I'd, all you have to have is the web browser showing. So then you've got a far, you know, we, everyone could be on the same page, even though they're not in the same room. So I'm quite interested in that approach to try and um, sort of get the language right a little bit just by using little games. I think because what happens is that... I can feel the tension build in people and nothing happens. It's, it's mm. almost like those quiet moments in a bad comedy sketch where there's just the audience go dead mm. and you go, well, what have I said? Yeah. Well, no one really understands. I, I, no one people, I tea people and I am one myself of a sort. We just love strange words and outre language. We really do. Even to the point where when we're working with other people in other disciplines, we, we try and learn their jargon as well so that we feel all clever. But really, that's the wrong way around. What we have to do is really all of us have to unlearn all this stuff and uh, learn how people might speak about it when they first come into contact with it. And we'd all get a lot further. Mm. It's true. Um, I think what's happened is that IT in general has always been an overlay for, for what we do. And it's been... Um, taken from an office environment and then moved into the consumer space. And those things really haven't shifted either. Um, we've still got similar words and, uh, and the language gets mashed up and just used casually. Um, mm. And yeah, there is a lot of opening up you have to do. I've, I've, I've ended up just finding a glossary website for people just go, look, if you're ever stuck, just have a look at this. Um, if you, and the amount of times I've had to explain clouds, cloud storage is amazing. Uh, it's yes. an ongoing, like a, a bemusing and puzzlement. And mm. you know, what is all this? What are you talking about? Yes, it's, 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 it's not very... really a cloud, is it? No, <laughs> no. Not a you mean there's no cloud. No, <laughs> no. We've been very keen on the show, Paul, to um, encourage. Uh, good user experience, good user interface uh, on the technologies that we use. And we have one uh, device 
uh, which I can't remember the name of right now, guys. Maybe you can remind me. Was um, it the, where the, the buttons were. Was it the, the button, the green and blue buttons? Was that the? Was oh, that, it, was well, that, that was the, the Cradle Connect. Cradle, oh. yeah. It's a set top okay. box, and um, the they they had they have a remote um, and the buttons to make it work or not, you know, say yes or no, are blue and green rather than blue and red because they found in testing that people didn't want didn't like to touch the red button because it said no uh, in a very in a danger way, right? Rather than a blue button that said just says no, not right now, you know, it doesn't suit me. So you know, we're keen on on explaining things to people and, and making sure that they feel more in control of what's going on, and especially now because of COVID. I mean, this where this whole um, program kind of started was about helping people get online. And we're aware that people are getting online now at a time when they might not have chosen to out of their own volition. And that's an extra burden on them and on us as, as uh, enablers. Very true. Um, yeah, um, I, what I like to do with people is, um, it's, a, it's a big word um, because I'm a, uh, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, it's, I call it a proprioception um, examination. Proprioception is effectively your muscle memory and your sense of space. And um, what I like to do with people is to get them to uh, their eyes and just work around their device. Um, just actually look at it again, actually fi find what these buttons are. And then we'll talk about what each one does. And then I'll actually encourage people to draw their own diagram. So it's about, getting a bit of it's mindset i tend to find is the biggest issue um user interface stuff is just so messy no there's no we we have w3c guidelines for accessibility on the web but there's nothing published for apps and i've got a client mm -hmm. with visual impairment who is who she rages constantly and she's constantly on the accessibility apple line so I think there's some real disparities and I think what has to happen is you, you start with the physical and then you work into the um, abstract, shall we say. Mm. Um, and I tend to work on process on goals. I work on a goal driven thing because what happens is we, everyone has goals and needs. If you just try to say, well, press this and press that, and press this, they have no concept of what you're doing. Um, and I, I think there's a bit of an issue as well, like I said before, in terms of what people have in the first place isn't necessarily the right thing. They quite often just get what they have. So they may need someone to actually talk to them. They'll quite happily go ahead and buy it sometimes if you actually give them the right rationale and give them a tryout of something. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've sort of got a lot of issues with um, how interfaces work. It's really interesting about the colour coding as well, because I've noticed that everyone, but everyone knows the close button on a window on every device. Everyone knows how to close a window. It's always the cross, the X, get rid of, you know, and, and that says a lot too. Uh, nothing about anything, you know. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm, I've, I've not really gone down that road too much myself. I've tried to work on a case by case basis. So it, it's lovely to find, um, I, I think again, John, many years ago when we first talked, I was looking at the Breezy, uh, which was a Samsung yes. tablet. Yes. And that was a very interesting scenario, which had which a one-to-one -one relationship with a person, but also had, had sort of a, um, an address book management by a family member. And uh, it was really quite a really good product. It, you know, it was a Samsung tablet. Um, it was quite expensive, but it was really well done, really well done. And it only had a few buttons and you could actually manage how many buttons were on the screen as well. You could remotely manage that. But what happened is that I didn't find the support very good. And I also found that all of a sudden they just changed their focus. They were getting asked by housing associations to provide a many to many, a one to many approach so that other people could get in and use it. And um, I'd been asked myself actually by a uh, housing association to talk about that. And that just wasn't there. I think that's an, that's, that's an interesting thing that's coming up that I don't know if it's budgets or capability or capacity, but they want to have devices that could be used by multiple people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't promote ownership, but it does mean that something's being done. It, it's, I don't know what that means in some ways. 
the it's, a very big issue. it's a very big issue um, trying to use devices which are basically designed for single use with multiple people because it's even a difficult concept to get across that, that it's just problematic. So whether it's security of the information you've got on the device or whether it's um, just basic usability between one person and the next, it's hard to expect people to use, a number of people to use a device that's specifically designed only to be used by one person. And so many of the tablet type, tablet and phone type devices are like that. Hmm. Absolutely. I mean, admittedly, with um, I think Apple are the worst culprit at being a one-to-one -one relationship. And I know that uh, when you set up extra users in Android, you are limited by age as well. All the versions of Android don't do it. And um, you can set up a separate instance with bigger fonts and better accessibility. But again, it still doesn't quite get around that whole mindset thing and being able to uh, adjust yourself to the device appropriately. And it might not even be the right device for you as well. Um, I've, I've had, I had um, a one lady I worked with who was Moroccan and her English wasn't so good and her eyesight was failing. And all we could do was get the, her iPad to talk, how she could talk into her iPad and get her iPad to talk to her. And she could try and build up her English a little bit. It was about the best we could do. Um, I think, and if we'd given that machine to someone else to work with at the same time, I think that, that wouldn't have happened. I think yeah, a lot of things that it is a relationship you build with the device. And that's why I try to focus on, well, what are your goals? What are your needs? Um, or else what happens is you, it's just going to be another lump of plastic and glass in your hands um, with no, I mean, sometimes they do too many things. And I think this is one of the things that you see with, I mean, like with the Breezy and the Comp and various other um, tools is that they strip down a lot of that because of the, it provides better access. And um, I don't know why it's been, it's, it's, it's a bit like why uh, accessibility software is so hard for visually impaired people. Uh, there seems to be a very small market, but the very high markup on the software. And yet um, there is a real need I mean, I'm 52 and my eyesight's not great. <laughs> and uh, yes, I know I don't look at tanks, but um, um, it, it's, it, you know, it, it, it really is an issue in itself about accessibility in general, having a more mainstream approach and being able to have that set up and, you know, and being able to have a bit of a wider, access, a wider audience on that. Um, Windows is actually getting a bit better but this is where things fall over. Um, it's about being able to give people, you know, with all the three-letter acronyms and jargon and everything else. Um, yeah, yeah, I think exactly. what it is, I generally say that it's 20 minutes a night you should be putting in. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, it's, we've discussed this on this show before and we talked earlier on about repurposing the computers with Linux, um, and you can also repurpose them to be Chromebooks as well. Um, why can't you do the same with mobile phones and tablets? Um, mm. you know, it seems to me that would be, if you, uh, there are lots of, um, well, there are a few out there, easier software interfaces. Why can't you just load those on any tablet or any, any mobile phone? Because that would make life an awful lot easier for us. We have talked as well about um, Recent Digital uh, is a digital agency and they've developed a, a project called Help in Hand which uh, repurposes old, unused smartphones. Uh, so it's a kind of a one button video call service to connect, to connect users with a nominated volunteer or family member. And sometimes that's all people need, you know, a one simple button if you do what you want. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, can I just apologize for disappearing as I did? I, I had warned uh, colleagues that uh, I was expecting a phone call from my GP about the pain I've been experiencing recently. And so I had to take it really. Um, um, but I apologize for that. Uh, and I was right in the middle of the story. I was telling about the fact that uh, all the county cricket matches this season are being live streamed on YouTube. And what, you know, to cut, cut the story short that I was going to tell, um, uh, I'd be watching them on my TV um, because uh, I'm going to, my blog post that I'm writing is going to be about all the different ways you can watch YouTube on your TV. And there must be quite a lot of people who don't like technology, who think they don't like technology, who could be tempted to watch a county cricket match on 
YouTube, given that they can't get there to see it. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think it's, uh, and they have up their game because previous years they had done most of the county matches were being live streamed, but they were just being done by a fixed camera. Now they've, they've gone to multi-camera. So it's a much better experience. I imagine a, a, a drone hovering above the baller would gra- give a great view. <laughs> Might be a bit distracting to the players. <laughs> yeah, but, well, I suppose, but it just sounds like a great option. I did see it. I, just, I, saw, I was watching a game yesterday where somebody hit a six and they nearly, hit, <clears throat> nearly hit one of the cameramen. So I think you do need oh. some danger money as well. Okay, well... So, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm, obviously I have not heard what you've been talking about for the last 10 minutes, so I apologise. Uh, I'm just going to listen, really, if no one. Um, you've been very good value, Paul. Um, thank you. Um, you've nearly taken up the whole programme, and, that, and that's not a criticism. That's, uh, that's a good thing. We had other things we wanted to talk about. But we, we could, I don't know, are there any other things we wanted to talk about that are desperately urgent, or could we leave them until next week? What do you think, Pauline? Um, I, just, I think I just wanted to mention the, um, the all-party... Uh, parliamentary group on right. speaking yes. skills okay. yep. um, and they've they've done a report on the impact of COVID-19 and lessons learned for improving digital skills in the future and I think it's just important to recognise that there is an all-party uh, group that um, believes that they've got a they've got a report that's got 15 uh, recommendations and so I won't read them all out but you know they well, want... I'm just bringing them up on the screen yeah okay so um I mean, the, the underlying thing, thing is that the government uh, must act now and invest in digital. Um, they they need to kind of work with educators, local authorities, and industry to develop cross cross part departmental digital economic economic recovery strategy. And I certainly find in my dealings with government that they they don't always include small charities in the, in that reckoning, and, and they're at the front line of delivering services and trying to help people digitally as well. So. I, I, I want to make sure they get included. Um, they need we need digital training resources, a basic introduction to digital skills. And I've said this at conferences where um, you know people need to people need to know basic things. Um, there needs to be I think there needs to be an expectation that people have have some digital skills and some and people do and often don't realise it. So it's good to have a structure around that. Um, they need, the government needs to future proof the UK's digital infrastructure. They might they should provide financial backing. For initiatives that that allow um, people to to, to 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 obtain devices and connectivity, um, fraud awareness must be. We've mentioned that in the program as well. Mm. You know, kind of people get deceived, and we want to make sure that that's as, as little as possible. And when it does happen, then people need to be helped to kind of recover from that, and for it not to have a long term negative um, negative effect. Local learning, uh, lifelong learning hubs should be created. Um, grant schemes, awareness raising schemes, collaboration between industries. I mean, a lot of a lot of um, local government and a- academics would say, you know, well, we haven't got any money. Well, their definition of not having any money and our definition of not having any money can sometimes be very different because we can make a little in the in the in the voluntary sector go a long way. Um, financial support for student devices, um, so backing and um, blended learning. Um, introducing new standards and accreditation and encouraging again lifelong learning and they talk about the auger recommendation of the like lifelong learning loan allowance and as someone whose partner uh, established lifelong learning uh, projects or you know kind of in our in our area in Birmingham including in South Birmingham where this show will go out on Hope Radio um, you know we, we would have big big encouragement for that. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Um, 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 I'm wondering um, that there's a sort of a gap that, that's really uh, going on that people with no efficacy or understanding or capability. I've been toying with this idea of a digital advocacy for some time because um, bri- gaps need to be bridged. And I think some people will never be what we would term as digitally aware or digitally savvy or, or online as such. And I think there's always going to be a need for that bridge. Um, and what's happening with mutual aid groups, that they're bridging the, the general uh, quarantine issues with real world interventions. And I think it's something that I think we'll see. I know that I, I, it, I already do it to a degree. It's a very low level advocacy where um, support and guidance is given on um, bills or uh, finding some information or, or just all sorts of things really um, but 
when you have a group of volunteers, this is a sort of a level of, um, well, I won the trust and secondary D, um, well, the, are the DBS checked? Are they capable of managing that scenario as well? Sometimes things get a bit deeper than um, you want. But the, this, um, the, this is all very much along the surface, it seems, the, what, what's been promoted there. There's nothing really definite that I'm seeing. There's, there's just all things that are already going on should just keep on going. I'm not really seeing anything about um, issues about broadband, Mm. Uh, being resolved mm. um, th that is especially I mean e I live a few hundred yards from a exchange and it's only recently we've had fiber um, there's all sorts of issues about how uh, people could be getting some um, financial support for online access um, I know the data packages are coming down in price amazing now uh, crazy so I think there's there's sort of some need some good advice it seems this is where the consumer watchdog, like the witch people, do really well. But it seems that they need, there needs to be a sort of a wider approach on it. CAB are just overwhelmed, I think, mm. They're dealing with um, unemployment issues quite often. Especially, I think, what is it? Every 20 minutes, they're getting a phone call about redundancy at the moment or something. Yeah, um, easily, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, we've talked on here about uh, data poverty and about the opportunity for communities to share the technical uh, uh, kind of uh, connections that they have, you know, people can uh, in communities can share their their devices or their Wi-Fi, when, you know, when they're not using them, um, and and people should have, you know, people who have smartphones but don't have data, you know, the smartphones is nothing without the data, so they, they need to that needs to be part of a package of support for for uh, communities and individuals. Yeah, uh, a friend of mine is a he's a bit of a pioneer in Wi-Fi. He was one of the early people that did war driving and uh, providing Wi-Fi network to his office. And uh, he was doing a um, community, uh, like a uh, like community Wi-Fi access, going to people that, around the area and asking to put a router in, like a secondary router to their internet connection, which would just siphon off a little bit. And it would mesh with other routers nearby and they would all hook up and provide what you would say is more of a utilitarian, like a utility out and about for people, very low level, good for, good for emails, tiny bit of web surfing. And did it for 10 years. And no one really knew about it unless you were sort of interested. It's very, you know, these things sort of sit on the sidelines. And then what happens is the peter out of their own accord because people just move on mm. and interest just fades because yeah. it's not a commercial. It's yeah. a bit like what happens with co-ops for um, people like yourself in the Orkneys uh, and in various rural areas when they, they, they band together, get their own broadband and uh, they've got their numbers, they've got their own service, build their own trenches, dig their own trenches rather, and then BT come along when they know they've got a customer group. That's right. Um, exactly. It's not. It's not only. It's not only that there's indifference. It's that there's actual predatory, um, predatory marketing stuff happens where as soon as you've got any sort of identified demand whatsoever, uh, it's not just BT, no, <laughs> but they. No, of course not. We, we can uh, we can use them as a shorthand. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yes, they are the, the sort of overlord for many small baronial internet companies. <laughs> Okay, so we're in the last minute of the show now. So uh, I think probably I'd just like to say thank you, Paul. Uh, it's been really, really good. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Yeah, well, you've taken up the whole show, and as I said before, that's not a criticism. That's a good thing. Um, <laughs> you know, you had a lot to say, and uh, we, we really loved uh, hearing it from you. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, really pleasure. if you're up for it, we'll invite you back on again in the future if that's uh, if that's okay. Yeah, more than happy. I'm, yeah. I can talk for whoever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> for all well, parts you. of the United Kingdom, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, whatever Another part countries. you want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there, if there's an Olympics in talking, I'm, count me in. All right. Pleasure to meet you, Paul. Thanks for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, Thank thanks, you very Paul. much. Thank you, Sven. And don't forget, we'll be back same time next Monday. Um, good to see you all. And email us, drtechshow at gmail.com if you want to be involved in the future. With that, I'll say goodbye. Thanks, John.